Okay, so as far as adding fractions go, I mean, the first observation we should make is that if the denominators are the same, doing addition is easy. Ooh, Zoom's doing this again. Okay, there we go. Two sevenths plus three sevenths. You just add the two. And the three, and you get five sevenths. Now let's just think of this. We've got seven blocks one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The two sevenths. That's two out of the seven blocks. And the three sevenths, well, that's three out of the seven blocks. So if we put them together, how many blocks out of the seven do we have? Well, we have one, two, three, four, five out of the seven blocks. So we have five sevenths of the blocks. Two sevenths plus three sevenths is five sevenths. We add the top. As you observe, there's no reason to add the bottom. The seven remains seven. Um, if we have different denominators, things suddenly become harder to deal with. Like if we have One half plus, let's, let's keep our fractions down. If we have one half plus one fourth, for example, this little picture I drew on the previous frame doesn't really work anymore. I mean, we've got Two blocks, and we have half of them. We've got four blocks, and we've got a fourth of them. Put them together, and what do we get? It's really not clear. So the, the famous prank here is to say, well, fractions aren't written uniquely. And I mean, that's just a kind of fancy way of saying, you know, one half is two fourths, is three sixths, is four eighths. There's a bunch of way you can, ways you can write any fraction. So if you have something like one half and one fourth, and you want to add them together. You find a common denominator. And again, this is just a kind of fancy way of saying a not very fancy uh, process. If you can recognize that one half is two over four, then suddenly adding one half and one fourth becomes just as straightforward as this was. Now that everything's out of four, we can simply add the top and see that one half and one fourth is three fourths. 
The question then becomes, how do we find this common denominator? And, you know, there are a few ways to think of this. Again, we're moving kind of quick, we're just sort of reviewing this material. If your principal wants this taught in a certain way, you might have to go through the textbook, but I mean, my main observation would be that you always get a common denominator if you multiply the denominators together. So if you've got A over B and C over D, then B times D will always be a common denominator. It might not be the smallest possible common denominator. It might not be the best common denominator in some way, but it will always be a common denominator. <clears throat> Two over seven plus three over five. We could do this addition quickly if the denominators were the same. Now, the denominators are not the same clearly. To find a common denominator, We can multiply the seven and the five, and we get 35. And what I mean when I'm talking about a common denominator is, you know, there's no way to write two sevenths as something over four. At least there's no nice way. There's no way to rewrite three fifths as something over nine. At least, again, there's no nice way. So we can't just decide to use 10 as a denominator because there's no good way to write two over seven as something over 10. And we can't just decide to use 14 as a denominator because there's no way to write 3 over 5 as something over 14. So when I'm talk saying that 35 is a common denominator, what I mean is that we're going to be able to write both fractions as something over 35. So to get to rewrite two sevenths as something over 35, it's the fundamental theorem of fractions. Once again, coming to our rescue. The fundamental theorem of fractions says that we can multiply top and bottom by the same thing and not change the fraction. So how did how do we get 35? Well, 7 times 5 is 35. So if we want the 35 down in the bottom, we should multiply by five. The fundamental theorem of fraction says we can do that as long as we multiply both the top 
and the bottom by five, it's okay. Two sevenths is ten thirty fifths. What about three over five? Well, how do we go from five to 35? We multiply top and bottom by seven. Or rather to go from five to 35, we multiply the bottom by seven, but then the fundamental law of fraction says, okay, you can multiply the top by seven as well. As long as you do the top and the bottom, it's okay. And 21 over 35, And we get 31 over 35, which I strongly suspect does not reduce at all. So we'll leave it be. Um, what, and again, this is in your book, if it's something that your principal or the director of Just for Kids is really into, but um, I think it's a mistake to focus on getting, you know, the smallest common denominator. That's the least common denominator. Some people seem to make it kind of an obsession. I think that in nine times out of ten, the extra work you have to do to specifically find the least common denominator is going to... Um, overshadow any advantage you get from working with small numbers. So really, the only time I wouldn't just do this, the only time I wouldn't just multiply the denominators together is if I happen to see, well, one of these denominators is a multiple of the other. Like I see that 10 and I see that five and I see that 10 is a multiple of five. I see that 10 is five times two. In that situation, I leave the 10 alone. And I look at two fifths, and I'd say, well, 10 is five times two, we'll multiply top and bottom by two. Two fifths is four tenths. And five tenths, we then don't have to worry about, because we already have that 10 as a denominator. I mean, going back a few frames, that's what I did here. I happen to see, well, four is a multiple of two, so I kept the four the same, I left the four alone, and I just adjusted the one half. I turned the one half into two fours. And I mean, if you happen to see a nice denominator, of course, feel free to use it. I'm not saying, you know, that these are the only things you're allowed to do. Just that actually finding common denominators, um, or rather finding least common denominators, is a time-consuming practice. You have to completely factor. 
factor, both the denominators, you have to find prime factorizations, and then you have to mess around with those. And I'm just going to suggest that anything involving prime factorizations is probably not a very efficient method and probably not something you want to obsess over. What if you're adding mixed numbers? Well, if we're adding mixed numbers, we do it in the parts. We take, in this case, it's seven and two, but we take whatever integer values we have, nine. And then we take the one fourth and the one third. And we add those together and we get whatever we get. Um, we need the common denominator. So what's the common denominator I could use here? Twelve, thank you. So here, multiply top and bottom by three. Here, multiply top and bottom by four. Nine and seven twelfths. But let's complicate this a little. Seven and three fourths plus two and a third. Mm -hmm. And I said this is a complication. The seven and the two still make nine. That's no different. But what about three fourths and a third? So 12 is still going to be our common denominator. Three fourths, we multiply top and bottom by three. Nine twelfths. Here, we multiply top and bottom by four. Four twelfths. So we get thirteen twelfths. But we don't want to write, bless you, we don't want to write 9 and 13 twelfths. Why not? Because it's more than one. Because it's more than one. Because the point of mixed numbers is that you have the integer part, and then you have something that's less than one. So, we have to recognize that 13 twelfths is one and one twelfth. And then we've got a nine. So our total answer ends up being 10 and one twelfth. Um, let me see. I phrased this in terms of addition. Subtraction is exactly the same. Find a common denominator. Two 
two ninths minus three sevenths. Sometimes if you're subtracting fractions, it might not be obvious, might not be immediately obvious whether the result is going to be positive or negative. It can be hard to look at two fractions and compare them. This is bigger than this. Well, the process of getting a common denominator will also make it obvious which fraction is bigger. So it will make it obvious whether this is positive or negative, assuming that it's not already to you. And again, I don't want to mess around with common multiples and look for, I'm just going to take the product of the denominators, nine times seven, and that will always be a common denominator. <clears throat> So the first fraction will be multiplying top and bottom by seven. Second fraction will be multiplying top and bottom by nine. And let me see, nine times seven, 63. Seven times two, 14, nine times three, 27. So we're going to wind up with a negative number here. And remember if you've got a larger number, and a smaller number, and we're subtracting the larger number from the smaller number. You just do the subtraction as you normally would, smaller from bigger, except that you get a negative sign. So this is 13, but it's negative 13 over 63. I don't think that simplifies. Um, in fact, I'm sure it doesn't. 13 is prime, so it's not going to have any divisors. And there, is the is subtraction. Um, this takes kind of a nasty turn if you have mixed numbers. Or maybe a nasty turn is slightly overstating it. But you can sort of see what, can, what might happen. You know, five and a fifth minus two and a half. Well, you can take the five and remove the two from it. No problem there. But if you try to take that one fifth and remove the half from it, well, you're going to wind up with a negative number, which is maybe not the end of the world, but our common denominator is 10. Two tenths minus five tenths. It's 
negative three x. And I think probably the easiest way to think of this, even though we just talked about how when we write the mixed number, you know, the numerator should always be strictly smaller than the denominator. But if we think of three as two and one, as two and ten tenths, and then we want to remove three tenths from this. That's two and seven tenths. Um, the alternative thing that the textbook suggests you could do with mixed numbers is just turn them into improper fractions. I mean, I think that's a pretty, uh, pretty extreme way of going about it. But you could do it. Um, and this is also a good opportunity to remind ourselves how we go from mixed numbers to improper fractions. We multiply the number by the denominator. And then we add whatever's in the top. So two times two is four, plus one is five. Three times three is nine, plus one is 10. And once you've, um, once you've gotten the mixed numbers, you can, or rather the improper fractions, you can get a common denominator. Six here. So 15 over six, 20 over six, 35 over six. Um, and if I started with mixed numbers, I would end with mixed numbers. You shouldn't, um, you shouldn't change the way a number is written unless you have a good reason to. Like if you're given a problem with decimals, your answer should probably be in decimals. If you're given a number with a problem with mixed numbers, your answer should probably be in mixed numbers. And I'm not too proud to say how I do this. So 6, 12, 24, 30. And then we have five and six doesn't go into five. So five, six, just counting on my hand like a little child would it? Um, I wouldn't add mixed numbers this way. I guess I might sometimes subtract mixed numbers this way, depending on what you're comfortable with. Like maybe when I wrote three as two, and 10 tenths, that doesn't really click with you. In that case, you could just write this as one fraction minus another by converting from mixed numbers to improper fractions and then finding a common denominator. <clears throat> Questions about adding and subtracting fractions. Let me just do one. 
for example, except that I'll put a variable in there. Five plus one over X. So the way I have this written on the board, we're not adding fractions. We're adding a fraction and an integer. But any integer is a fraction. Five is five over one. I guess rational number would be the fancier way of saying this, but I just default to fraction. So five over one plus one over X. And the fact that we have an X here doesn't change anything at all. We're going to get the common denominator and we're going to get the common denominator in just the same way we've been doing, which is to multiply those denominators together. And we get that x is our common denominator. So 5, we multiply top and bottom by x. 1 over x, well, we multiply top and bottom by 1, but that doesn't do anything. Uh, let's see, what am I doing? I wrote something weird. We have five over one is what I meant to write. And we multiply top and bottom by X. So we have a five X plus a one over an X. So if, um, if your denominator isn't just a number, if it's something weird or something like a variable, that's not fundamentally altering anything about the problem. Mm -hmm. So fractions, um, fractions work kind of the opposite of the way you're probably used to, which is that you probably think that adding numbers is easier than multiplying numbers. Um, with fractions, the opposite is true. We spend about 40 minutes on addition. We'll probably spend about five minutes on multiplication. Um, multiply M over N times P over Q. You multiply the tops. You multiply the bottoms. There's no need to get the common denominator. We just multiply the tops, multiply the bottoms. Two sevenths times four ninths is eight over sixty three. Let me is two times four over seven times nine, which is eight over 63. Um, even if your top and your bottom are are messy, let me change that one to a three.
We multiply the tops. We multiply the bottoms. Again, you can think of any integer as a rational number. So if you've got two times five sevenths, we can think of that as two over one times five over seven. Two times five is ten. One times seven is seven. So having sped through multiplication again because it's this is what young children want addition to be. I mean the number number one problem you're going to have teaching adding fractions to kids is that they're going to just want to add the top and the bottom and it doesn't work. So multiplication is what people want addition to be. You really do just multiply the tops, multiply the bottoms. Um, with division, we'll slow down again, because division is something that gives people pause. When you have one fraction divided by another fraction, that's the same as having the top fraction multiplied by the reciprocal of the bottom fraction. And I mean, you can see, I, uh, I can't remember the name, maybe, uh, there was a, a Japanese animated movie that my dad really likes about uh, a possibly autistic coded girl and one of her things was that she was trying to learn math and could just, just could not grasp this and it really is hard to see on an intuitive level why this should be true I admit that I mean, I can, I can say why it's true on a purely mathematical level. On a purely mathematical level, this is a result of the fundamental theorem of fractions, where we multiply top and the bottom by the same thing, and in particular, you see that if we multiply the top and the bottom by the reciprocal of the bottom, then those Q's cancel and those P's cancel.
And then in the bottom, everything cancels, so we're left with one. And division by one doesn't do anything. So you wind up with the top fraction times the reciprocal of the bottom fraction, just as we say. But again, in terms of like trying to explain this with like blocks and stuff, I don't have such a good intuitive explanation for this. So for example, one over seven divided by two over three is one over seven times three over two. Then three times one is three, seven times two is four. Five over two thirds. Again, everything that we do with fractions works. Just fine with um with rational numbers. So we can think of what am I trying to say? What I was trying to say with that sentence is that any integer you can think of as a fraction, just divide by one. So we just learned how to divide one fraction by another. We've got an integer divided by a fraction. It might seem like that's a different type of problem, but if you rewrite five as five divided by one, Then the trick of multiplying top and bottom by the reciprocal works. And you get 15 divided by two. This is something, I mean, this is looking ahead. We'll cover algebra later in this class, but um. This is something you use a lot when you're solving sort of simple equations, like two thirds X equals seven. You know, sort of the, the standard way of getting rid of multiplication you don't want is to use division. So you got X is seven over two thirds, but seven over two thirds is messy. And you don't want to write that as your answer. So you say, well, we have seven over one, times three over two. Multiplying or rather dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. Okay, I need to take a look at the homework. Um, just I realized the last homework I gave you had stuff that I kind of skimmed over in class. Um, 
I'm going to post the homework on Canvas. It will still be submitted in person. If you don't have access to a printer, I can also bring in uh, a few print copies on Wednesday. But you at least have access to the homework before then. And I will see you Wednesday. Have a great week. Good.